Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Denise Burkover, and I'm the Collections Curator at the Ryerson Image Center. Um, on behalf of the RIC, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our noontime collection talk with Toronto photographer and collector Stephen Evans. Before we begin, I would like to start by acknowledging with respect that today is Orange Shirt Day, our national day for truth and reconciliation. Today, we mourn the victims of Canada's residential school system. Our noontime collection talk is virtual, but we are broadcasting our program from Ryerson University, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university recently acknowledged its own role in the history of the residential schools and committed to a number of actions, including the decision to change its name in the coming months to address that legacy and furtherance of truth and reconciliation. Additionally, we at the RIC accept our shared ongoing responsibility for this land where our institution stands. We are committed to doing our part to bring about a better future for all people who live here during this time of environmental upheaval and crisis. We are pleased to be resuming the Noontime Collection Talk series after a bit of a hiatus. As some of you may know, these talks traditionally take place in the Rick's Peter Higdon Research Center, which you can see in my virtual background behind me. Um, started by the Rick's founding collections curator, Peter Higdon, the talks offer visitors an opportunity to view works from our collections without barriers while learning about them from a variety of different perspectives. And while we are not able to offer that vital in-person experience today due to the virtual format, we are very excited for this opportunity for focused discussion on one of the RIC's most exciting new acquisitions. I also want to note that today's talk is being offered in conjunction with the university's Alumni Week events, which conclude on October 2nd, and we are grateful to the Alumni Office for their support. We also hope that you will join us for the next talk in this series, um, which occurs on Thursday, November 18 at noon, when acclaimed Canadian photographer Edward Bertinsky will join us to discuss his recent career spanning multi year donation to the RIC. And now I would like to mention just a few program notes before we begin. Please note that we are recording today's event for future reference and upload onto our online platforms. After Stephen's talk, we will commence a QA and we invite you to contribute uh, questions throughout the lecture using the QA function uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, in the case of a technical difficulty, we thank you for remaining patient with us while we correct the issue. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker for today, Stephen Evans. Uh, a graduate of this university's media studies program in 1982, Stephen is a Toronto-based photographer whose work has focused on architecture and the urban environment for more than 40 years. The genre of architecture has likewise been a central passion within his collecting practices. He has compiled over two decades, a comprehensive resource of early photographs and other objects associated with the 19th century British photographer of architecture and landscape, Francis Bedford. Stephen will be speaking with us today about his recent gift to the RIC of nearly 1300 works by Bedford, which together form the extensive Francis Bedford research collection. And now I'm happy to turn things over to Stephen. Thank you very much, Denise, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to attend this virtual tour of the Francis Bedford Research Collection, especially on this solemn day for truth and reconciliation, a day to honor the children, survivors and communities unjustly affected by the residential school system in Canada. It is a day to listen, a day to recall this tragic legacy, and a day to uh, contemplate a better future for generations to come. And now without further ado, let's commence the presentation. I began studying and collecting 19th century photography many years ago when I was a student at Ryerson University. I was enchanted by the look and mystery of these seemingly ancient views and fascinated by the stories of the intrepid photographers who used experimental techniques in the most challenging situations to produce masterful images that survived the passage of time. After a few years of learning how to collect, I began to focus on images related to my personal interest in urbanism and architecture. I began looking at Francis Bedford's works some 20 years ago when I acquired one of his particularly beautiful images to add to my collection of 19th century photographs. 
It certainly wasn't my intention to collect Bedford comprehensively. But when researching the image, I became frustrated at how little of Bedford's work was represented in the realm of photographic literature. At the time, there was really only one major text resource, Bill Jay's seminal 1976 thesis, Francis Bedford, 1816 to 1894, English landscape photographer of the wet plate period. The essay was assiduously researched and really well written. It primarily addressed Bedford's ancestry and his professional career as a lithographer and photographer but it suffered from a lack of good illustrations. It also lacked a detailed description of who Bedford was as a person, the kind of information that might help us understand the kinds of things that may have affected or motivated him as an artist. This of course is very understandable because Bedford left few personal records that give us insight into his personality. Even contemporary descriptions of him by his colleagues that might reveal his interests beyond photography, for example, his views about political and social events of the time or gossipy recollections about foibles when traveling seem to be non-existent. In his lifetime and beyond, Bedford's work was well known and highly admired, but almost nothing was known about the man himself. The lack of personal details and the dearth of published examples showing Bedford's range of accomplishments frustrated me and raised my curiosity. So with the advent of the internet as a helpful resource, I decided to take a chance to dig deeper and examine Bedford's work to engage in a kind of photographic forensic investigation with the hope that by building a comprehensive collection and hopefully discovering new undocumented material, I might learn more about Francis Bedford that in turn I could share with others and add more to the public record. Today, after about 20 years of scrounging around antiquarian bookstores, photo dealer bins and boxes, and the deep pit that is the internet, the collection is now indeed a comprehensive assembly of lithographs, photographs, publications, and ephemera, which I think in its entirety provides additional insight into the life and career of this important 19th century lithographer and photographer. I could not have completed this journey without the considerable assistance from friends, dealers, curators, academics, and students. Thanks to all of you for helping grow this collection. We can all be proud to see it safely housed and cared for at the Ryerson Image Center, where it will be available to be studied and enjoyed for generations to come. I will begin this presentation with a look at some of Bedford's ancestry to show you how his family background in art and architecture influenced the course of his career in lithography and photography. This will be followed by a chronological look at Bedford's artistic and professional careers to help set the context for the final section a closer look at the diverse contents of Francis Bedford Research Collection. Francis Bedford was a direct descendant of a well-established middle-class Cornish family by the name of Tubb. John Tubb, Francis's grandfather, was born in 1741. An upholsterer, furniture maker, and builder by trade, it was John Tubb who adopted the Bedford surname in 1785, receiving it by decree to perpetuate the family name of his wealthy uncle, Reverend Thomas Bedford of Letterkenny, Ireland. Four years later, upon the death of the Reverend Bedford, John Tubb, now known as John Bedford, inherited his uncle's very substantial estate. He also inherited an important family of relatives that included high-level civil servants, solicitors, architects, and clergy, thereby significantly raising his family's social status. In 1793, with his newly acquired fortune, John Bedford purchased a large 24-acre property in Chiswick near London, on which he built three Georgian mansions. In 1875, the property and houses were purchased to be incorporated into the UK's first planned garden suburb, now known as Bedford Park. The photos above show two of the three surviving mansions that Bedford built, Melbourne House and Bedford House. In 1805, John Bedford died, leaving the remains of his estate to be shared by his eight sons. The eldest, Francis Octavius, became a highly respected architectural draftsman and architect. Francis Octavius Bedford, the photographer's father, was born in Kent in 1784. At the age of 30, he married Sophie Curtis. They had five children, two daughters, and three sons. It is believed Francis Octavius Bedford began his professional career as a clerk and apprentice employed by the neoclassical architect Sir John Soane. 
Song's work included public and private buildings, homes, churches, and a museum that housed both his life's work and his personal collection of architectural artifacts. A volume of plans and drawings attributed to Francis Octavius can be found in the museum archives. In 1811, at the age of 27, Francis Octavius accompanied Sir William Gell and John Peter Gandy Deering to Greece and Asia Minor on an architectural research mission sponsored by the Society of the Dilettanti an organization of collectors and artists established in 1734 to study and promote interest in classical antiquities. Francis Octavius's role was to produce drawings of classical Ionian architecture for publication, part of an ongoing series published by the Society. Shortly after returning to London, Francis Octavius established his own successful architectural practice, specializing in ecclesiastic buildings in both the Greek Revival and Gothic styles. After a successful career, he died at his home in Greenhithe, Kent in 1858. Here, in this beautiful example of one of his engravings from the Dilettanti project, you can see the influence of classicism on his design of St. Luke's Church in Norwood, London. And finally, our man, Francis Bedford Jr., the lithographer and photographer. Francis Bedford Jr. was born in Camden, North London on August 13, 1815. Little is known about his upbringing, but given his father's professional and social status, we can assume he was raised with a very good education. He commenced his professional life as an apprentice draftsman in his father's architectural practice. There is no record that I have found that he ever designed any buildings. However, his artistic interests and abilities were recognized early when in 1833, at the age of 18, one of his paintings was accepted for exhibition at the Royal Academy where he continued exhibiting his works until the 1840s. The subject of Francis's early works was primarily about architecture. Bedford's combined experience as a draftsman and illustrator of architectural subjects, along with the probable introduction to his father's professional acquaintances, helped to attract the interest of eminent architecture and design writers of the time, such as George Aliff Poole, J.W. Huggle, and Matthew Digby Wyatt, as well as highly regarded London publishers including John Wheel and Day and Son, among others. It was with their encouragement that Bedford turned to lithography as a useful and lucrative means for reproducing his and other artists' work. His earliest published lithographs were based on his own drawings for a book entitled Sketches in York, published in 1841, a copy of which is in the research collection. Among his other early published works were fold-out charts of ecclesiastic architecture, such as the one illustrated here, a chart of Anglican church ornament. These easy to read guides with text and illustrations by Bedford highlights his expertise in architectural and art history, his precise skills as an illustrator and his increasingly sophisticated ability with stone lithography. These charts are really quite ingenious. The full size lithograph 17 inches by 33 inches was divided into panels and mounted on a thin canvas which folded down into a cover that was about four and a half inches by six inches. In 1843, at 28 years old, Francis married Mary Graham. Together, they moved to Holborn, London, where he was listed as a lithographer artist. Mary and Francis had two children, Arthur, born in 1845, and William, born in 1846. By 1850, Bedford was probably well aware of technical advances in photography, and he clearly recognized its potential use for his practice of lithography. I still have not uncovered any documentation describing exactly when Francis Bedford began taking photographs, nor have I located any description of how he learned the art and science. But in 1853, he was commissioned by Henry Cole to photograph works of art in the collection at the Marlborough House. Cole was one of the driving forces behind the creation of the great exhibition held at the Crystal Palace in 1851. Using the wet plate collodion negative process, Bedford produced 84 albumen prints that were assembled in an album that was purchased by Queen Victoria. Five years later, in 1858, Bedford put the photographs to good use as reference for the production of chromolithographic illustrations published in the Treasury of Ornamental Art by Sir John Charles Robinson. On the left is an example of one of the Marlborough House photographs taken by Bedford in 1853. On the right is his chromolithograph based on the original photograph 
and published in 1858. A copy of the Treasury of Ornamental Art is in the research collection. From 1854, Bedford expanded his photographic pursuits, moving beyond the confines of the studio environment to photograph architecture and landscapes that interested him. He became active with the newly formed Photographic Society, contributing works to the Society's first exhibition that year. The following year, his work was published in the Society Club album, and in 1857, he was elected to the Photographic Society Council. Bedford's achievements with photography and his involvement with the Photographic Society impressed Queen Victoria sufficiently enough for her to commission him in 1857 to travel to Germany to photograph the town of Coburg, the birthplace of Prince Albert. The resulting photographs were presented as a birthday present to Albert from Victoria. This photograph is to be found in the Royal Collection and sadly is not part of the Francis Bedford Research Collection. In 1858, Bedford's father died, and at this point, Francis began to concentrate his professional pursuits entirely on photography. With his family escorting, assisting, and even posing for him, he began to travel throughout Britain, taking photographs of rugged natural landscapes, quiet village scenes, and historic architecture. He deployed a variety of cameras to produce stereo view, half plate, full plate, and large 10 inch by 12 inch wet and dry plate collodion negatives. And by 1859, he entered into an agreement with Catherall and Pritchard of Chester to publish and market his photographs. This is a pivotal moment when Bedford transitions from being a professional lithographer and amateur photographer to being a full-time commercial photographer. If you look closely at Bedford's photographs, especially his stereo views, you can sometimes pick out Mary, Arthur, William, and even Francis himself who often appear in the shots, presumably to add a bit of humanity and scale to scenes that were otherwise uninhabited. You can also spot his specially designed horse-drawn carriage fitted out as a mobile darkroom parked conspicuously in some of the views. On top of the cab was a metal container to carry water, and the back of the cab was used to store his cameras, negatives, dark tent, and processing supplies. From 1854 to 1862, Bedford contributed 650 photographs to numerous important group exhibitions, including the Photographic Society in London, the Manchester Art Treasures, Photographic Society of Scotland in Edinburgh, the Architectural Photographic Association in London, the Glasgow Photographic Society, the International Exhibition at Kensington, and his only solo exhi exhibition of his Tour of the East Views, produced by Day and Sun at the German Gallery in London. This is one of Bedford's contributions to an exhibition of photography sponsored by the Architectural Photographic Society in London, 1861. Bedford's contributions were all large format albumin prints. They were rigorously composed, highly detailed, and generally very heroic studies of ecclesiastic architecture that architects, artists, architectural conservators, and historians would find useful. They clearly demonstrate Bedford's familiarity with art and architectural history, as well as his confidence and technical prowess with the camera. In 1860, Bedford also undertook important commissions to provide architectural photographs for publication and distribution by the London publishers Thompson and Company. These, like his Architectural Photographic Association photos, were also intended for use by architects, artists, historians, architectural conservators, and so on. This lovely image taken in Wells Cathedral is from the series of architectural photographs published by Thompson and Company. The cathedral is suffused with light that describes the scale, depth, height, and materiality of the architecture, all of which helps to convey a strong sense of place. The woman posing was probably his wife, Mary Bedford. In early 1862, shortly after the death of Prince Albert, Bedford was summoned on very short notice by Queen Victoria to escort the Prince of Wales and his entourage on a diplomatic tour of the East and the Holy Land, thereby taking on the role as probably the first ever official royal photographer. From February to June, working with a large glass plate negatives in difficult, unfamiliar environments, Bedford produced perhaps his best known photographs. Upon his return to London, Deluxe albumin prints published by Day and Son were exhibited and sold at the German Gallery on New Bond Street in London. 
The work received high acclaim in the popular press and photographic journals, cementing Bedford's place as one of the most admired photographers of the day. There are 74 prints from the tour in the research collection, including single and variant prints. With his trip abroad and his exhibition behind him, Bedford resumed his photographic journeys in England and Wales. For the next few years, he traveled during the spring and summer months to amass views of ancient architecture, uninhabited landscapes, village street scenes, and epic views of historic towns and seaside resorts. In the autumn, he would return to London to attend to the business of printing, publishing, and distributing his work. Catherall and Pritchard continued to market Bedford's burgeoning inventory of stereo views, CDVs, and album prints of various sizes. This is an example of a single mounted image published and sold by Catherall and Pritchard. Groups of these mounted photos were also assembled together to be bound in elaborate covers and sold as souvenir view books. Between 1863 and 1866, Bedford published works in books including William and Mary Howitt's Ruined Castles of Great Britain, The Recent Discoveries at Cyrene by E. A. Porcher and R. Murdoch Smith in 1863, and W. H. Thompson's The Holy Land, Egypt, Constantinople, Athens, a series of 48 photographs, uh, 1866. These books containing Bedford's photographs are among numerous others in the collection, including various editions of the same publication. This photograph of the head of Perseus marks Bedford's return to the studio. The prints in the copy of Cyrene in the research collection are really superb examples of mint quality albumin prints. With the unexpected death in 1867 of his 22 year old son, Arthur, Francis Bedford ceased his travels resigned from his role as vice president of the Photographic Society and thereafter produced photographs only sporadically. At some time between 1867 and 70, Bedford relinquished the day-to-day -day operation of his business to his surviving son, William, an accomplished photographer in his own right, who continued to print and market his father's inventory. For the balance of his life, Bedford continued his involvement with photography primarily by participating in Photographic Society meetings returning to his role as vice president for a short time, but then officially retiring in 1886. His wife, Mary, predeceased him in 1888, as did his 44-year-old son, William, in 1893. Francis Bedford died 17 months later on the 28th of June, 1894, leaving behind his vast inventory and a modest estate. And to my knowledge, few if any personal or even professional records or correspondences. In 2013, Paula Fleming and I went on a safari in Highgate Cemetery to track down Bedford's grave. With gracious assistance from the staff, this is how we found it. The gravestone seen here in the middle was tightly packed among others, overgrown with weeds and vines, and the lettering on the gravestone was eroded and unreadable. So this is the inventory list for the Francis Bedford Research Collection. There's a total of 1,982 photographs, 669 of which are original prints published in bound publications. There are also 280 lithographic prints, mostly in books, with a few extracted examples stored separately. That amounts to 2,242 individual items. In addition, there are numerous periodicals and assorted items of ephemera. In the slides that follow, I'll show you more examples from the collection. These are examples of publications containing lithographs by Bedford. His early works were based on his own drawings or the drawings by other artists, but many of his later works were based on his photographs. On the left is his first publication, Sketches in York, lithographs that were drawn by Bedford and published in 1841. In the center is another example of the six folding charts and maps that are in the collection. And on the right is a copy of the treasury of ornament. The collection also includes 14 lithographic plates extracted from books. I have a particular admiration for the early works Bedford produced between 1854 and 1863. The earliest images, like these two, were more than just architectural studies. There's a sense of melancholy in some of the images, particularly in those that included people. 
The image of the gent slumped at the door at Barfastone is a triumph, a portrait and an architectural study that combined allude to matters of decay and time passing, of age and aging, of survival. There are multiple versions of these two images in the research collection. These are examples of works from the series of architectural views published by Thompson and Company in 1860. Photographing in interiors was a real challenge with wet plate negatives, large cameras, and slow lenses. Exposure in these relatively dark places were onerously long. When I look at Bedford's interior views, I can't help but think that he was moved deeply by the exquisite quality of light that he would find inside these ancient buildings and that the challenge of capturing that was well worth the effort. There are approximately 88 large format prints from this series in the research collection, possibly the largest assembly of these works in one place. In a way, these two images demonstrate two picture making imperatives for Bedford. The Tintern Abbey Choir Arcade suggests the sensibility of contemplation and nostalgia. Illuminated with terse girl light, there seems to be a narrative that is not just about architecture, it is also seems to be about place, history, memory and solitude. This is the photograph that inspired me to collect Bedford's work. On the other hand, the Lincoln Cathedral photograph on the right is a pragmatic image with a very specific intent to document as definitively as possible the structure, material and iconography that adorn the facade of the Lincoln Cathedral. It is what we affectionately call in my business of architectural photography, a meat and potatoes image albeit a particularly beautiful one that might be especially of interest to those studying Gothic architecture. I'm disinclined to think that Bedford set out deliberately to explore the relationship between humans and the natural environment, but like so many photographers of his generation, he found the landscape an irresistible subject for his photographs, reflecting a prevailing sensibility among Victorians that the landscape was a place of physical and spiritual healing. By 1860, when these photographs were taken, Bedford began systematically seeking out popular destinations to photograph and then market his idyllic views to well-to-do and middle-class travelers eager to acquire souvenirs. This page shows uh, examples of variant prints. The collection contains many duplicate and variant prints from the same negative to try and get insight into Bedford's practice. Comparing these images helps inform us about the kinds of decisions he had to make about printing, finishing, and disseminating his work. In this group of albumin prints of the Norman Staircase at Canterbury Cathedral, you can compare the cropping and mounting of the prints all from the same negative. The top left is a full untrimmed, unmounted print likely produced shortly after the negative was exposed. In this case, the entire image on the negative is visible. The top right is a dome topped crop from the same negative. In this case, the shape is achieved by manually trimming the print, which was then glued to a thick beige colored cardboard. This was a popular look employed by early Victorian photographers, though it was sometimes used to deliberately obscure the darkening caused by lens vignette at the corners of the image. And on the bottom left, this print has had the edges trimmed manually to remove the black edges from the contact sheet. Some image loss of the images from trimming is inevitable. This print was glued to a thin pa beige paper mount that suggests a probable early print date. And finally, an example printed and trimmed by another photographer mounted on a high quality thick white card stock with printed titles and credit below the print. Bedford is credited on right below the print and on the left credits Francis Frith as the printer and publisher. This is the presentation found with photographs from Francis Frith's Gems of Photographic Art series, published almost 10 years after the photograph was originally taken. The research collection has 634 stereo views spanning a period of about seven years of Bedford's travels in England. Managing a numbering system for a burgeoning inventory was a complicated issue that necessitated constant maintenance and refinement over time. As new images were added, series of images based on locations were created. These changes can be confusing as the same image may appear in several different series with different numbers. 
Thanks goes here to Graham Wood, who dissected the unruly and complicated inventory of approximately 3,000 images into four basic categories, each denoting a change in the numbering system with a change in the style of the mount. On the top left, we have what we call type one. From 1859 to 1860, the card was characterized by a mousy brown color with an applied label with title and number printed in red and attached either to the front or the back of the card. Type two, produced between 1860 and 1861, is a buff yellow mount with title and number located on the bottom right below the images. Type three, produced between 1863 and 1865, shows a yellow mount with the title and number running along the right side of the images. And type four, 1864 or later, was a bright yellow mount with the title and number running along the right side of the images and the series title and Bedford's name on the left side of the card. On the left is an inventory and or negative reference card for stereo views with negative numbers inscribed between the two frames. This was certainly not meant for distribution. It's the kind of record that any studio might use to maintain and retrieve negatives for printing. On the right is an example of one of eight very scarce catalogs published by Catherall and Pritchard. Each catalog lists the titles and numbers, print size and type of print available for purchase. Bedford also produced carte de visites, which were typically embossed with lithographic titles and numbers on the front, either below or beside the image. The prints were actually trimmed from stereo views and the print numbers correspond to the numbers of that stereo view. Generally, the CDVs had a lithographed monogram with Bedford's name on the back. There are 118 carte de visites in the collection. The collection also contains numerous photographic albums. This is a very large album that was probably displayed in a retail milieu, such as a stationer's store. It contains numerous photographs fitted loosely on pages and was used for choosing, purchasing, or ordering prints. It contains 179 Bedford Albumen prints in a variety of standard formats showing views of Tewksbury and Hereford Shire. In the back of the album, there's also an assortment of 49 similar photographs taken by Francis Frith, which gives us an opportunity to compare the work of the two competing photographers. Other albums in the collection include a personal CDV album with uh, images chosen and arranged by a customer, a typical personal travel photograph album containing views of well-known tourist destinations taken by a variety of photographers. It's not unusual to find examples of Bedford's photographs contained in these kinds of albums. And then finally, an assortment of 16 souvenir view books with mounted albumen prints on titled and numbered mounts. These albums were published by Catherall and Pritchard. They ranged in size and typically contained from 10 to 50 images. Considering the quality of production with leather covers embossed with gold lettering and letterpress titles, these were likely to have been most attractive to the carriage trade. The research collection also includes 10 published books and six journals illustrated with numerous Bedford photographs. There are three copies of Ruined Abbeys, including two first edition copies with a conventional cover, as well as one very scarce presentation copy bound in leather. The discoveries at Cyrene, which I'd mentioned before, documents ancient sculpture and contains some of the best preserved albumen prints in the research collection. There are 74 loose views in three formats from the Tour in the East series. These two images are among a number of deluxe size prints on oversized mounts with printed titles that were marketed by Day and Sun in connection with the exhibition at the German Gallery, London in 1862. Bedford also offered unmounted versions of the prints from his own studio. In addition, there were series of smaller crop prints published by Marion and Company, as well as reduced size copy prints that were published in various books. So here you can see a comparison of the three basic formats of the Tour of the East views printed from the same negative. On the left, the original deluxe size print for exhibition published by Day and Son in 1862 with the title, negative date, and number inscribed in the negative. 
In the center is a reduced size print for a series published by Marion and Company, possibly in around 1870. This is physically cropped image from an original deluxe size print and has been renumbered and retitled. And finally, the reduced copy print, which was taken from a deluxe size print for publication in books after 1862. Here are examples of important publications related to the Tour of the East, illustrated with copy prints taken from original prints. Bedford was on a pretty tight schedule on the Tour of the East, and there was probably little time to experiment with complicated and time-consuming techniques, such as producing a three-panel composite panorama. I've taken these three sequentially numbered images of Corfu and assembled them in Photoshop to see if they actually line up. Sadly, they don't, but I still wonder if this is an attempt at making a panorama that just didn't quite work out as planned. The collection also includes ephemera related to the tour in the East, including this custom portfolio cover produced by Day and Son to store deluxe prints, as well as examples of lithographs taken from Bedford's photographs printed in the London Illustrated News in the 1860s. And in the sundry category, there are examples of other printing techniques. To my knowledge, there are no surviving salt prints actually made by Bedford. It is uncertain, in fact, that he ever made them at all. From the very beginning of his career, he preferred the inherent sharpness of wet plate collodion negatives to render his highly detailed images. On the left is a salt print of a Bedford image that is inscribed and dated on the back in an unknown hand, crediting a Mr. Sutton as the printer. This was likely to be Thomas Sutton, the British photographer and promoter of the Blankart Everard modified calotype process. The reason that Sutton produced this print remains a bit of a mystery to me. Perhaps he produced this as a sample print to convince Bedford of the merits of his printing process. Lastly, on the right is an early example of a photoelectrotype reproduction taken from Bedford's photograph of Wells Cathedral, possibly a photo galvanograph made by Paul Pretch or Duncan Dallas. So there you have it. An overview of the Francis Bedford Research Collection now held at the Ryerson Image Center in Toronto. What you have seen here is just a fraction of the content. I believe there still remains much to be learned about Bedford's work, and it is my hope that this collection will serve to inform and inspire further research for the future to come. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you again for attending.